Okay, yeah, I don't know what was going on with that, but it uh, the video would not go away. It took control. Ah, I think we're I think we're good now. So thank you, Martin, for just saving my hide. Um, hello everyone. Um, Jason McDonald here with this block of pajamas 2022, uh, the coziest Python conference in the known universe and part of the unknown universe. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and I'm joined by my very noisy co-host. My dogs, who you will see inevitably throughout the video. Uh, so coming up first, uh, in just a minute here, um, we have uh, Trivka Carper. I probably just messed up that name. Um, and he'll be presenting about building custom data applications under insane expectations. Um, before we get to that, though, make sure that you join our Discord. Um, links down there in the uh, ticker. Uh, and there's a giveaway for um, a book uh down here as well so make sure you uh have uh read, have um entered that raffle to win that uh but with no further ado i'm going to turn this over to um should i give how do you pronounce your name correctly because i'm yeah. messing this up uh, my parents weren't that internationally minded i guess so it's Tirigva. Tirigva. yeah that's right that's yeah, it's almost perfect Tirigva. nice right. Okay, hey, usually I have to do it once. Excellent. So I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, take it away. Yeah, let me see if I can share the screen here. All right. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, a period of my life where I worked for a Norwegian startup. So for about uh, four years of my life, I lived at, I and worked for a company called Coinite that was a startup. So I started there uh, when we were basically zero, I was simply number 30. And over those four years, we grew to 700 employees. That's when I left. <clears throat> and uh, that company was a company that is building like a product, which is somewhat like Snowflake for industrial data. So delivering a database in a way data warehouse but for industrial data so things like time series and sensor data and 3d models and seismic data and not that much tablet data and over those um, four years we were uh, trying to use like machine learning and analytics on top of this database in order to help very very big companies stay profitable basically so uh it was a company that where the second customer was like BP and the third customer was Exxon. So very good sales leads there. But it also gave me some insight into what these companies uh, wanted to achieve with that. And basically, they have been looking at the success of companies such as Amazon and Google and Facebook and looking at what they did and how they used uh, data and more uh, digitally native uh, ways of working in order to deliver value in a different way. And they were doing a lot better than they were. And they were all thinking that in like 10 years, we are not profitable anymore. We have to do something. How can we do something? We don't have the people. How can we like do something for real in order to like stay profitable and looking for partners and they find companies like Cognite in order to come and help them. And this is kind of how the insane expectations are set because it's somewhat of the lines like if we give you 10 million dollars can you deliver like a billion back that's kind of the, the the setting so i thought through this talk that i i think that uh there's a lot of people talking about becoming data driven going data driven using machine learning for business and how that's important and so on but no one is like talking about what is actually done in practice right so there's tons of like management type talks and there's like zero on like what, what actually happens. Well, how does it really look like and what's the nitty gritty? So in this talk, I thought I'd talk a bit more about that, basically. Like what, 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 what really is it that we're talking about? So how it happens in practice is that these people have figured out that we need to change in order to stay profitable 10 years from now. They look for a partner. They... Um, some people like also advertise for a partner in the sense that they, they do like these RFP processes, like saying that we need this and that. Can you like compete for uh, giving us an offer? Whereas others are like 
actively searching through their networks, trying to find some company that they can talk to in order to help them like change how they work and look cooler and stay profitable. And when you start that dialogue with these companies, then it's typically like top-down digitalization initiatives that comes out of it. So you, you sit on the top level and you agree that, yeah, okay, so let's identify the most valuable cases that we can do in our business to like increase profits or cut costs or avoid manual labor and so on. And this is like typically a, a conversation that starts pretty high up and then trickles down. So starts at the CEO level, then trickles down to the different business lines at the VP level and down all the way down to the business lines. And that's matched by the company who's kind of the uh, um, partner in this case, which, which was Cognite in my case. So I came in at the VP level myself and, and I had a team of data scientists going in to deliver. And we were like talking together, what are the like, best use cases that you have? And they were talking down and, and finding that. Then... It was to scope these projects into like chunk size, okay projects, find a way to staff them and then execute. So very top down initiatives that we did across like BP, Exxon and, and a lot of other uh, big energy companies, not only oil and gas, but also like power, uh, hydropower and, and, and that kind of thing. And then it was to execute. So I thought I'd, I'd talk about what what the hell is this in practice? Uh, and, and that you would maybe uh, find that somewhat interesting. So the first case we did back in 2018, uh, it was like uh, December 2017, January 2018. So I, I know that m many of you maybe know this world a bit and that it has gone forward, but I thought I'd go back and see, see how bad it was. So Back then, we were get, getting a case on an oil and gas compressor. I, I don't know how much you know about the, the by now, very shunned field of oil and gas. And, uh, but <clears throat> uh, basically, in order to transport gas along the big distances, you need to comp compress it, right? So that you, you build up the pressure so you can uh, transport the gas over a, a, a significant distance. Now, at especially offshore oil and gas rigs, <clears throat> that's very important in order to like get the gas off there and into the shore. Uh, and when that oil and gas compressor shuts down, then, then you have to stop the entire production. And the production at, at such a facility costs like millions of dollars per, min per, per minute. And, and they don't see it as kind of, okay, but then we will extract that oil and gas later. Now they see, see it as lost revenue problem, uh, more or less. So they, they had a problem where this uh, customer where where they had a compressor that shut down from from time to time and it took them some hours to to get it back up uh, we were asked to provide early warning on that and if they were getting an early warning on that they could like schedule maintenance uh, in a time period where it was better for them and have the parts ready and so on and then maybe cut the downtime in half uh, what we had to work with was like sensor data. So there are sensors all over this place. Uh, it was prior events that had happened and, and, and a lot of technical documentation. So what did we do? So back then we, we, we took two data scientists and a project manager from our end working on this for like three months. From the customers, we said that, okay, it's nice if we could talk to someone who actually knows anything about compressors and oil and gas and, and, and so on. Uh, and they, they put off a, a person with some time. So we had like weekly syncs with that person and, and we were just talking gibberish over uh, uh, Google Meet uh, for some hours every week. And then uh, we were saying things like, yeah, what do you think about this model? It will tell you blah, 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 blah. And he was saying like, yeah, you know, that, that sounds reasonable. And at the end, when, when, when we were done, we had built like a clustering model. I, I don't know how much data science you know, but we had built like a clustering model that tells you that this is normal operations and this is like a normal. So two clusters, a normal and normal, and tuned kind of the threshold to previous events. Uh, and then we deliver that. What happened then was that this thing went into production. So we, we, we had deployed that model <coughs> in Databricks <laughs> of all places. Uh, running and, and, and sending then email notifications to the users. What happened was that after three months, the, the compressor was acting so bad that it was shaking so much that the people were like thinking that this thing is going to just jump off the whole platform. 
but the model said nothing. <laughs> it didn't capture that event whatsoever. Then the next month, like after that, we, we, we tuned the threshold. And then it had like seven false alarms for one month. And then it was shut down the whole project. So it wasn't used anymore. So on the left here, you can see the solution that we had. So we had uh, data sources that were plugged into this uh, database of ours. And then we were using Databricks as a way to get code running and checking something. And then we were using Grafana as a way to plot things. And we were using SendGrid as a way to give alerts. That was our entire solution that we, we got up in like three months. Didn't go very well. Next, after that, we, we were asked to do a, like that was a year later, uh, that we had like a valve monitoring case. So on these uh, oil and gas facilities, there are tons of valves, like in the tens of thousands, the valves. And they have to be inspected because if they leak, that's a problem. So they have to inspect them through like checking closing times, opening, and there's like a lot of regulations around what they need to check about that. When, when you see like how many ex inspections are actually results in something and, and how necessary are they, you, you're going to find out that like 99% of uh, inspections are just pointless. No need to have them at all. So... This is, of course, a big cost, and it's a cost for, for different reasons that, than you might think. It's not the time that you, you walk around and, and spend inspecting them. It's that you have to actually shut down parts of that production facility in order to do the inspection. Uh, that's the most costly part of it. You have to plan a lot in order to reroute things around other places, and you need to reduce production and that, and that kind of thing. So we, we, we got a task of like notifying which valve to inspect. Uh, again, we had like sensor data, with prior reports and, and documentation. And, and the thing was to build something where they could get like notified, please check these valves and don't care about this. So again, you can see now that we've grown, we learned like in the, in the past project, we, we delivered something and, and it failed like flat out. It was like pointless, gave no value at all. So this time we, we, we insisted on co-locating with the users and working like super close with the domain expertise and the users. So this time around we had not only one domain expert, but we had like one expert leader from the management team at the customers. And we had like an actual user who was doing inspection on valves in the team. We had two data scientists and a project manager, and we had a data engineer who was like backing up from time to time. And these people were working together, co-located for four months, working in like agile two week sprints with like insane demos, insane pressure. So every two weeks there was a demo. And when it was a demo on, on these kind of things, then this was actually, these demos were live streamed to the CEO <laughs> of a company like Exxon, like following this. And after that, we did like a short rollout to, to, to all the facilities and a, and a handover. So we had learned something in the sense that we were, were staffing it a bit more and, and really close with the customers in order to try to avoid uh, creating the wrong thing. Um, the solution we got was that we had uh, uh, exchanged Databricks for now, a Google Cloud Functions instead. And Grafana couldn't, wouldn't cut it as like a, overview over a lot of, of um, uh, valves. So, so we'll be using Plotly Dash. This is uh, before Streamlit in a way. So it's before Streamlit was, uh, was announced. So we were using Plotly, Plotly Dash and, and deploy that ourselves on Kubernetes. What happened was that <clears throat> uh, once this uh, project was complete and it was uh, handed in, then it was never used. Uh, and that's very, very interesting, no? So we had actual users in the team giving ideas, saying that this is what we want, testing it and so on. They were part of the team, but what we didn't do was to, to get actual buy-in from all the other users. So if you have, it's not enough to have like a user in your team. That user becomes part of your team. It's not really a user anymore. You need to actually have it like in the business line with the users who are going to use it in actual settings, which was a big, big, big learning for us. Then the year after, uh, we had another case on like maintenance planning. So 
when they plan what to do maintenance on, um, it leads to that you need to shut down areas in order to do that maintenance. And, and one of the bigger problems they have is that they, they don't know, they, they're not able to plan so that they should do maintenance on several things within the same area they shut down in a way. So the task we were gotten was to build a planning tool that optimizes that. The data we had was like maintenance records, sensor data, 3D models, and, and technical drawings. Uh, we needed the technical drawings in order to, to figure out which area it was that we, we were going to close down. And this time around, we've really grown because now we had not only the same setup as earlier, but we also had a front end dude now in order to like really take one step further in order to get that UI up quickly and be able to iterate with the users in the business line themselves. And we had a, a supplied an infrastructure dude in order to keep it up too, and a data engineer. Um, the solution you can see on the left, and you can see that the Plotly is now been <clears throat> replaced with like a full stack front end uh, um, stack. And that project is actually still ongoing. So it started in 2020. It was like scheduled to run for, I don't know, like half a year, uh, 10 months. But the reality is that if you're going to develop something like this and have it actually be used and so on, you can never leave it. Still continuous co-location and agile two-week sprints. And it's a long continuous testing period because after 10 months, it was actually given to the users. And then, of course, that's when the real work starts, right? So what we learned over these years was that for the first case, domain competence is an actual must. Like we, we were sitting uh, data scientists and a domain expert, but separated and just talking online for like every week. It's, it's not enough. You, 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 you're not able to like build the right thing in that way. Like talking over Google Hangouts is just isn't enough. And the second time around, we, we learned that even though we had that domain competence and the actual users as part of the team, it didn't get any buy-in in the actual business and were never used, even though we had the users in the team. So you need an extremely tight collaboration with actual users. And for the last project, we, we learned that we can never let the project go. Maintenance has to be easy to do, right? So So like the maintenance load just keeps growing. And the whole thing here is about like time to first user interaction because that's when you learn what people actually wants to use. But what we also saw that like teams became big, 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 <laughs> big teams and iteration cycles became super slow. Like when we, when we started out, you could do an iteration on a, in a week, right? But with a big team, it's like four weeks. And the maintenance load just grows and grows and grows and grows. And still, it's difficult to build the right thing. Still no guarantees for people actually using it in, in, and getting any impact. But that's not so strange now, is it, right? Because if you're going to build a data app, that's not only about building the right user interface. It's also about doing the right modeling and ana analytics. It's about modeling the data, and it's about testing and getting feedback from users. It has a lot of components to it. So when you get something out and you see that the users don't use it, then there's a lot you need to iterate on, right? So, OK, so that was not the right way to go about it. I need to create a new interface. Maybe this is better. Then I need a new modeling type of thing. Maybe we need new data, and then that's a big thing. And when that is scattered across a big team, like there's different people doing every part of this, then how many iterations can you actually do? It's super hard. It's very, very hard to get, get something out the door that actually users want. And then this top-down uh, digitalization approach where you like first determine the project, then you scope everything out, and then you start this, then you need things to be so valuable that it's so hard to do. Right, so actually getting your ID that you know out the door is super hard. So how many IDs does really get tested? Right, super few. 
And how valuable does an ID need to be in order to like kick off a machine like this? It's very, right? It's, it's in the millions of dollars in like savings per year. Otherwise you could like forget it. So how, how much potential are we really squandering, right? How many like low hanging good ideas are there that we, we could have just tested and would have been better? So in 2021, we, we, we quit uh, Cognite and, and we started DataButton in order to like try to do this in a different way, like get up some tooling, deliver some tooling that, that could enable data people to do it all themselves. So with DataButton, we are creating like an all online workspace, all Python, making it like super easy to go from an ID to an actual data app. And the whole point, what we are optimizing for is like, to get up that first prototype super quick so that you start getting user interaction and you can iterate. And to keep it like super easy to maintain and, and to keep it like actually up. So thank you. So I think I'd say that through my four years, I'd learned that top-down digitalization is expensive and rarely works. And I think that we need tooling and the proper people in the right places in order to have it more bottom up. See the opportunities that are there and and actually being able to build something quickly and test and, and see if that, that, that works. So thank you. Yeah, I've been muted this whole time. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's why I mean, my mouth is moving and no words are coming out. <laughs> <laughs> so I was saying thank you very much for that. And if anyone wants to ask any questions, um, ask over in the uh, in the live chat there or in the ask speaker room, and I will uh, relay those relay those I, questions. I, uh, I would like to say something. I I hope yeah. people. Uh, what what you can find when when you talk about digitalization, data science, and machine learning, and like these kind of initiatives, I think there's there's almost no people who talk about what they actually do, right? There's so much like general advice and like you should do this and that and not that and so on. So few is talking about how the sausage is made in actuality. There is nothing to be found, right? There's either like how do I model this kind of thing, or it's like you should work agile with like blah, blah, blah. There is nothing of people who actually talk about how the sausage is made in these kind of things. I think it, this is my encouragement to everyone. Start talking about what you actually do. Because I think that's really liberate this thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's that, that, that thing of where when we're creating content of the community, I see that. It's either the, the, the very general, especially beginner stuff. It's like, here's how to code in Python. And here is how to uh, create a machine learning uh, data model on a on an Arduino in your grandmother's basement to recognize pictures of cats and distinguish them from pictures of continents. You know, it's either hyper specific or hyper general. And yeah, you're right. It, a lot of that practical stuff gets kind of falls between the cracks. Yeah, so I think like if, if you look around, the, the, around, there's so much like imposter syndrome going about it. It's such a hard job uh, and people don't talk about what they actually do. Uh, and, and I think it would be a, a lot better and people would feel it a lot better about themselves if they actually knew what people were doing out there. Um, and, and we could get forward. Anyway, yeah. open up. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, talk about what you do and talk about your mistakes too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I agree. <laughs> well, uh, if anyone has any questions, um, the big thing, did I get it right? The big thing is going to be in Discord. Uh, so hit them up there. And uh, yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.